Hello, and welcome to Zim Explorer. I'm Dr. Abstract, and in this Zim Explorer, and we'd like to take a look again at an app that we've been making called Baby You Can Tune My Car. So this is the second part in the series. You'll want to look back at the first part if you haven't seen the first part yet. So let's go uh, take a remembering of what that looks like. Uh, we will hit the yes. Yeah. And the idea was a car animates in and then we can tune the car with various sounds here. So there's the roar, the purr of a jaguar, along with the purr of the jaguar of the car, and you can set the panning and stuff. So that was the tuning of the car. And what we're going to take a look at is how we bring in this car and our buttons. I'm going to pause the sound on that. So let's try that again. We hit the button, in comes the car, in comes the buttons. Note that they roll in one more time. You ready? Yes. In comes the car, the buttons roll in. A touch hard to see, but they do. And then these guys, I think, just fade in, and this thing uh, pops on up there like that. This animated in. This was the first thing that animated in. We'll try that. Animates in, car animates in, and these all happen roughly at the same time with slight pauses in between. The idea is not to watch each one. The idea is whoom, stuff is coming in. Uh, so in the last Explorer, we mentioned that a lot of people animate too slowly. Uh, probably take what you think is a good animation and cut its time in half, and you'll find that it just picks up the pace a bit. Animation should be felt rather than necessarily watched <laughs> for the most part. Uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. So, great. Where'd we get to then? Uh, we had gone through the init, loading in the assets, all that kind of stuff. What we're tapping, uh, we're tapping on that button. We're then animating out the the title, and we're animating out the button. And it, when that button finishes animating, that is when we bring in the car. So, here we are on this next explore then. How do we bring in the car? What are we doing with the sounds? That kind of stuff. We'll see how far we get. Now, the car uh, shakes. So the car does, a, and the way that we shake is a wiggle. So the car does a shaking, and that would be pretty easy to do. Well, here is the car. Let's start with the car. It's an asset. And we're center regging that on the stage. The reason we're center regging is so that when we wiggle, it will wiggle around the center of the car. It looks really silly if we don't have it center ridge. So let's take that off and we'll just center the car. The car is a bitmap. That means its registration point naturally is at the top left corner. When we center reg, it moves it to the center of the car here. But watch what this looks like if we didn't center reg. In comes the car. Well, it's in the wrong position. Uh, first of all, I guess we've... Why would that be? We centered it. Um, not sure. Let's try this again. Hang on. Are we centering the car? We're moving it down 70. That should still have no problem. We're animating... Oh, the wiggle uh, right here. The, so, well, I can't turn off the wiggles because... So the Y position is... If we're center reg, then that can be just the stage height. But let's see, I don't know how big the car is. The Y position, I'll guess, and just call that something like 200. We'll bring it in a little bit better. Refresh here. Baby, you can tune my car. In comes the car. And let's see, can you tell? It's going up and down, so it's a little bit harder to tell. But if it weren't going up and down, let's go uh, take out the wiggle of the up and down. That would have been an easier way to handle that. And then we'll see that it's wiggling around its top left corner. So this would be the top left corner here. We'll put an outline on that. Dot outline. And you can kind of see what's happening there. Well, actually, I'm not sure. the. Yeah, I think the outline will animate with it. No, it didn't. So we'd have to, the, anim, the outline got left to the right-hand side, I suppose. Um, so we'd have to outline it later once it animates in. Okay, not going to bother. Top left-hand corner is where it's wiggling about. So that's why we have center ridged. So keep the center ridge in there. Bring this back, and uh, actually probably undo's are easier to deal with. And a center ridge, good. 
We've moved it down a touch so that we have some room for those controls. We're animating the property uh, from the stage width plus 500, so estimating half the width of the car roughly. So this is off. We're animating the X from that location. So there's the from. That means we an end up animating to that location. And the neat thing is, is we can properly center that. And so we know that it's in the right position. And then when we add the from, it's not, we don't really care so much. So it's just somewhere off to the stage right in a certain amount of time. So we're animating in the car from the left. We're also chaining on a couple wiggles. We're wiggling the rotation uh, about zero rotation. Normally, we would just say how much we're wiggling. So if we said two to four, that's a fairly big wiggle, I think. And let's see, that's what that would look like. And we refresh here, bring in the car. And there's the big wiggle, that's two to four degrees. So you can see that that is quite a wiggle on the car already, uh, a little bit too much. Now hopefully Antonio is not going to get upset with us. He's an animator and we've taken one of his illustrations and we're fake animating it in a sense. And note the shadow underneath is not staying on the ground. Um, probably could have separated that if we wanted to. Left the shadow on the ground, uh, animate both things. And again, I just did, you know, I didn't think people would notice too much. So kind of left it there, but an animator I'm sure would notice, so <laughs> should we show him? <laughs> I'm not sure. Antonio, <laughs> do you want to see your car animating? Uh, but anyway, when it's wiggling less, it's certainly less of a, an issue. So that's a hard-coded wiggle, and what we wanted to do, we had a vision where we would make it change how much it's wiggling based on how loud the sound is. So that added some complexities here. And here's how we did that. Now basically what this is doing is calling a function. Each time it goes to wiggle, uh, each time it goes to wiggle, what a wiggle is, is it runs an animation. Once that animation is done, it, it knows it's in a wiggle, so it will then pull a different number for here, or may pull a different number. So what this is is the min. Let's go back to numbers two and five. <clears throat> First time it wiggles, it picks a random number between these two, say three and starts wiggling it three degrees. It picks a random time between these two times, say 200, and now it's going to rotate three degrees in 200 milliseconds. That animation is over, and then Wiggle says, okay, now start another animation. It picks a random number from here and heads to here. So the problem is we want the range of our random numbers to change based on the, vol the volume. So we implemented the Zim V technique, uh, which is a pick, or uh, used to be Zik, but now we've made it more general to the world. Instead of a Zim thing, Zik, it is pick, uh, because that's what Zik stood for, for picking. What pick does is it delays the picking. So if we pass in two numbers here, we're always getting a random number between these two numbers. But with pick, what we can do is pass in um, if we pass in an array here, say if we pass in 1, 2, 3, oh, that's good enough, 1 or 2, then pick would pick one of these. Each time it goes to wiggle, it would pick either 1 or 2. If we pass in a range here, min colon 10, uh, we'll call it 1, uh, max colon 5, then it would pick a random number for, this is for the minimum, it's almost like a meta, a meta random. It would pick randomly between that range. But another thing that pick can do is it can just use the results of a function. So here we have the results of a function. Oh, okay, put there undo because that's the wrong thing. <laughs> almost there. There we are, these are ours. So this is a function, it's an arrow function, which normally looks like that, uh, which may also, if you're used to it, look like this, function, an anonymous function there. So that's an anonymous function that would re oh, return, sorry, return min r. So that's what that other function was saying. This is an anonymous function that returns a variable called min r. So each time wiggle goes, it calls this function right here and finds out its result. And each time it's being told, use min r. All right, let's back out of that. So if we go back to an arrow function, it looks like this, arrow function. 
That's the same thing as the anonymous function. Except if you've got something that only returns a value, you well, if you've only got one line, you don't need that. If it only returns a value, you don't need the return. And you don't need the semicolon. So cool, huh? Um, if we passed in one parameter, p or t, <laughs> time, it would look like that. Pass in a time, receive a min r. Uh, times time or something like that, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, anyway, we don't have one parameter. We've got no parameter, so that means we're stuck putting the round brackets of the arrow thing. All right, but that's a pretty tidy format in ES6 then to return min r. So each time we wiggle, we're also going to find out a max r, for that's max rotation, min, ro min y, and max y. Same deal there. That allows us to change the minimum rotation and maximum rotation somewhere else. And where we do that is in the dial. So the, as the dials go up, we basically make min r go up and min ma or max r go up. And we'll see that a bit later. But that's us wiggling then uh, based on the volume, as we'll see later. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> So uh, here are the initial sets of master volumes. Uh, we're going to uh, do some adjusting here. It's, it's not quite uh, tit for tat, as you'll see. But anyway, those are the master volumes. Here are the master pans. And then we're bringing in the sounds, putting them in into an array of sounds. Anytime you're I'm going to operate on these sounds, and there's four sounds, and I'm going to operate on them pretty well the same way with four dials and four, four uh, sliders for panning. So you could give them names if you wanted to, like uh, car, car two, or like const car, const car two, const roar, const roar two. Then every time you operate on them later, you would have to use those names. Whereas if we put them in an array to start, if we store our assets in an array, later on we can use an array number. And that allows us to loop through things and only write code once and have it operate on all four sounds. So that's what we're doing. We're storing our sounds in an array. Each time we're getting the asset, we're playing it because really what we're, what we're storing these for in the first place is so that we can adjust their volume and adjust their pan later. To do that, you need to to store the results of the play in, a, in somewhere. And here we are storing each one in an array rather than in a variable. Um, that gives us what's called a create jazz sound instance that we can then later change the volume in the pan. But we also set a volume in a pan to start. We also set it looping. Now this is a bit of a pain because we've hard coded these same values in there, in there as well. As a matter of fact, they're wrong in there, aren't they? Huh, it's interesting. <laughs> See, that's what happens. Um, 0.9 we want, and 0.9 here. Well, all of these things will be 0.9 was decided. And there is an example. We did this on purpose to show you an example as we explore. There's an example of what happens when you have the same value in two different places. So um, really, I uh, just hesitated to say master volumes at zero master volumes at <laughs> etc. It just made this look really, really long. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, maybe we should have tidied that up. It is possible. Now, I would have been just as long the other way. We could have set these first and then created uh, this from the values of these, but it would have been just as long. We would have been saying at sounds at one dot volume and probably even longer. So anyway, we'll keep those visually hooked up. They're right next to one another. Hopefully it won't be too much of a pain. Or we could have, like I said, filled all those things in, accessing from the master array. We're really using this, these things later on. Uh, the point wasn't really to use them here. The point is later on, we've got to use these values. OK, so let's get to later on. How does that sound? You still with me? Uh, I'm going off to play frisbee golf soon, or it's not called frisbee golf, uh, disc golf, through the beautiful woods of Dundas. And, and we will be exiting Pleasant Valley, where we live, and going up the hills of, uh, of Dundas, which is just beautiful, past waterfalls, Webster's Falls, all that kind of stuff, and out into Christie Park Conservation to play through pine forests. And it's just a beautiful day with lovely clouds and blowing trees. So 
<laughs> let's see. We've got some dials and some loops coming up. Uh, let's see for the uh, sliders. So tell you what, why don't we get the sliders and dials in place and then we'll cut it here and I'll go off and do my frisbee. So uh, dials and sliders. Here's a dial or some styles for the dial. Dial style, do you like it? And a slider, uh, slider look, sly look, slider look. Um, often we want to know what we're applying styles to. So usually I don't build it, all this stuff first. I will say, oh, we're going to tile some dials. So here we are tiling tiles this time, not styling tiles. A new tile and oh, this is an, like I realized that this is silly. Initially these dials were all um, now they weren't different anyway. This is ridiculous. You do not series the same thing like that because you don't need to. So we'll take that out. We're going to tile the dial. That's what a tile does. It naturally clones each of these. So there's no point in doing a series in this case. If you were um, if you were wanting to tile a dial, then a slider, then a dial, then a slider, then yeah, you would tile a series of a dial, slider, dial, slider, and then the tile would pick along the lines of those series. But here we're just making four dials. So there's four dials across one row and that's the spacing horizontal. We're centering it on the stage and positioning it 100 from the top. So don't don't redo the center. So this is a way that you can center something on the top. This is kind of too bad. It's a two step, but whatever. And then we're animating that in. We're animating that in a rotation. We're waiting a touch before that animates in because we actually do animate in the car. So we want the car to start. And then we start to dial our dial in our dials, uh, roll in our dials. And that's us rolling. And this is a from again. So there's a from. That's why this is negative because we had to roll it negative and then we're rolling from that to zero. Uh, if you don't get that, don't worry too much. In this amount of time, and uh, the sequence is, uh, do you want to see this slowed down? 1,600, and we'll make a sequence of uh, 350. Let's try this out. We refresh here, watch our dials dial in. There's one, two, three, four. So they were spinning so fast, I could kind of see them spinning on the on their place. So watch as they come in here. You see how they kind of spin, yet they're not moving fast enough for their spin that they did. So we slowed down the series. Uh, the spin for them right now is too fast. We'd have to slow down the spin. Uh, whatever. You know, so, oops, why? Just tile that one dial. Great. Uh, re sequence reverse is true as well. So we're bringing that in a sequence. If we didn't do the sequence reverse, can you imagine what will happen? Basically, the first thing that got added to the tile, which is this one, will come in first, and the others will have to go over it. So it would look like this, <laughs> which looks a little bit sloppy. This one comes in and stops, and the other ones kind of come on top of that. You want to see that again? It's fun. It's like, I don't know, some klutzes or something. Bonk, 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 watch out! Bonk, bonk, a slapstick interface. So uh, we know that that may happen and often happens as a matter of fact. So in Zim we built a sequence reverse which allows us to instead of doing the sequence in the order of the things in the in the container we're sequencing in a reverse order of the things in the container. Nice huh? And then the loop uh, here we are looping the dials. Uh, don't let me forget to we're looking at the the, the dials and the Slider. Uh, I thought these were sliders. That's that's more dials. What the heck? Dials are here. What are these things? Oh, okay. We're applying some some effects to those dials inside of the dials, and then we're doing total volume, and then we're doing sliders. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! You know what? Let's talk about getting the dials in rather than how we were setting the, the volumes because that's that's a good one to look at. So right now we're just talking about getting the car in, getting the dials and sliders in. In the next Explorer we'll talk about how we controlled those. We do have some sliders down here that are brought in roughly the same way. We've got a bunch of sliders and again brought in the same way incorrectly. On the code pen, we've, we've launched this on code pen, so often in code pen we'll build here uh, locally on our computer and then take the code that we built. Uh, if you look this car for instance is in a code pen directory um, so all uh, many of the things sometimes we build directly on code pen 
The interface is a little clunkier there. It's not bad, actually. It's great. It really does the same as Atom. So it's great. Um, and so half of them we build there, half of them we build here locally. And if we have assets, we usually build here locally and then transport everything after. So on the code pen ones, we we corrected that. I just didn't come back. And I noticed it when we launched the code pen. Went, oh, wait a minute, we don't have to series that. Um, and so came I, I had to come back and adjust these. But now we are. That's fine. So const sliders um, are brought in. We center them. We pose them. And then we animate from. And it's the same kind of deal, except this time we're animating in the alpha. We're not animating. We're not rolling them in. We're just animating the alpha up. So super. But what we didn't look at was the style. So um, what allows us to tile simply this new dial and simply that new slider is the fact that we've added tie, uh, styles to them up above here. So we've given it the min and the max of the dial as well as a step. Otherwise, it's just the same. We could have, if we wanted to, animate it, the, or not animate it, but set the style for a background color uh, here or whatever. And then on the slider, the same deal, some mins and max. We're uh, changing the bar length, the bar width. We're making an inside slider, so that's what uh, makes that slider look this way, where the the button is inside. And when you do that, note that it hits the end there. And same with here. Uh, normally, a button on a slider goes past the bar. This is the bar the slider would be on. And zero would have the button sort of centered on zero or centered on the max because it's a button that is outside. But this is a button that is inside. So that um, gives us a slider of this effect. We could have had a little square in there as well, but just decided to make that round. We made that round by taking the height of the button. This, this, these styles will be applied to the button of the slider. That's handy. And we're setting the corner to the same, and that turns, or well, corner to half, that turns it into a circle. So it's a sort of a cheating way to make a circle as the, the button for a slider. And uh, making sure that that button, this is on the button, has a border width of zero and a shadow blur of one. Otherwise, you can kind of see a little outline around the button and a shadow on the button, and we didn't want that in this case. So that's us setting the styles for a note that it's on the style. You have types and type dial, type slider. That's our kind of like how you would style a paragraph tag in general. So it is one extra step to be able to do that, but it does add clarity. Um, in, in CSS, you've got a mix of these are, these are on the tag, and then we use a dot syntax for a class. Well, we don't have a dot syntax. Instead, we put it in a group. So if we had group colon something, that would be our classes. And you would have the class name here, class name here. So we can't use a dot. I don't think we can use a dot anyway as a name. of a, we're, we're inside of an object literal right now. So it does add one extra level there. Mind you, on the other hand, if we wanted to, we could have just put min right here, min colon zero and comma. So if they all have a min colon zero, mind you, that's a default anyway. So I don't think we would have had to do it. Well, then we wouldn't need to put it here. We wouldn't need to put it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that's a different min. We could do that. Anyway, you can take any style and put it out here. If you want everything to be color pink, then you can put color pink here. And all things will have color pink unless they're overwritten here cast in the cascading manner, like always. But um, yeah, the style is a little bit different here in Zim because we're using object literals. But uh, any anything that you want on a dial or a slider, you would put in a type uh, bracket first. OK, not the end of the world is one little extra step. But on the other hand, it does lead to a clarity. Here's all your main uh, styles on, on the objects. And here's all your classes. That would be the groups. Uh, and then outside of that would apply to everything. All right, I think that's good. When we come back to a, a, a Zim Explorer, when we come back, we are going to um, see. Uh, uh, I hate that. We're going to see. <laughs> I I moved this sound. I'm trying to hear. I'll, let, let me do that again. Uh, let's see. Let me pause that one and bring this down. I move the sound to the place in where I want to play, and I bring up the volume. And what happened, this is how it's supposed to sound. Are you ready? A fade in like that. But I, um, 
I bring up the volume and then I find that when I move the cursor or when I move the, the location of the sound, it stopped the sound. So I bring up the volume and I go, oh, the sound's not playing. Why isn't it playing? And so then I hit the play thing, but now the volume's all the way up. So it just cuts in without the crossfade. Oh, I'm such a, such a novice. I've only done a thousand of these things. You think I'd uh, remember how to do that for now. But anyway, this this has been a Zim Explorer, and I'm trying to get to this this uh, screen right here as well. This has been a <laughs> Zim Explorer. <laughs> now the sound is ending. Uh, that's funny, isn't it? Uh, I'm Dr. Abstract. Hopefully you're laughing with me and <laughs> not going, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Um, anyway, all the best. And we'll come back for another Zim Explorer. And we'll take a look at probably the last part of this where we're increasing the amount of shake based on the slider and the dial, or well, it's really just the dial, I suppose, uh, not changing anything based on the pan, aside from the pan, of course. All right, ciao, bye.